Prisoner42 checked the LEP's official site and was amused to see that he was no longer on the top 10 most dangerous list. They'd forgotten what I have done, he thought with some satisfaction, which is exactly what I planned. Turnbull sent a quick V-mail to Lenore, one of the dozen he sent daily. Prepare yourself for travel, darling. I'll be with you soon. He waited breathlessly for the reply, and it soon came. A single word. Hurry! Turnbull was cheered by the prompt response. Even after all these years, they hung on each other's words. But he was a little worried, too. Lately, all of Lenore's messages have been brief, often no more than a phrase. He did not believe that his darling wife was not inclined to write more. He believed that she grew too weak. The effort was too painful. Turnbull sent a second mail to Ark Sewell, an NLP turncoat who had recently employed to make sure his wife and affairs were well looked after. Lenore grows weaker without my fairy magic beside her, Mr. Sewell. Take special care. Turnbull grew suddenly impatient. Mere hours separate us, my dear. Hold on for me. The authorities were mistaken, of course. Turnbull Root was extremely dangerous. They had forgotten he was the elf who had stolen millions of the LEP's own weapons budget. The elf who had almost managed to destroy half of Haven City just to get rid of a competitor. I would have done it too if he thought for the millionth time. And if not for my holier-than-thou little brother. He banished this thought. Thinking about Julius would just get his vitals up and the jailers might notice. I should get myself a little treat, he thought, sitting down at his terminal. It could be the last one before I go. Vishby will come for me soon and the LAP will realize their mistake. Too late, of course. He smiled at his reflection on the screen as he typed a brief message for a certain website. One is never too old for mischief, Turnbull realized as he pressed send. It is universal law that fugitives flock together. No matter how large the posse on their tail, people on the run always manage to find that one low-down dirty dive with the cheapest hooch run by the dodgiest innkeeper that not even the police knew about. These establishments generally have steel doors, paint over their windows, mold in their bathroom stalls, and don't serve anything with more than two ingredients. The sozzled parrot was such a place. The owner was a certain dwarf called Barnett Riddles, who ruled the roost with a certain wheedling punch that made him a likable host in a sleazy sort of way. And if wheedling panache were not enough to calm a troublemaker down, then Benet would follow it with a tap from a stolen LEP buzz baton. The Sozzle Parrot was a dwarf hangout, and the club motto was, If you're not welcome there, you're welcome here. Which meant that every exiled criminal or slumming fairy in North America sooner or later turned up at the Sozzle Parrot. Barnett Riddles made the perfect host, as, by some freak of nature, he was one of only a tiny percentage of fairies who were over four feet tall. And so, as long as he wore a bandana to cover his ears, Barnett was the ideal go-between with the humans, who supplied him with liquor, slightly turned beef for his quesadillas, and as much firepower as he could shift out of the back room. The early mornings of this morning in the Sozzle Parrot were pretty much the same as any other. Dwarfs sat hunched over tangards of ale in one of the booths, a couple of sprites were playing video crunch ball on their handhelds, and half a dozen elfin soldiers of fortune were trading war stories by the pool table. Barnett Riddles was deep in conversation with the dwarf at the bar. Come on, Tombstone, he wheedled in a charming way. Buy a couple of guns, a grenade at least. All you do is sit there and drink creek water. Isn't there someone you'd rather shoot a couple of times? The dwarf grinned, baring his trademark tombstone teeth. It's getting that way, Riddles. Barnett was not discouraged. Then again, this particular dwarf was a born optimist. Who else would set up a bar for photosensitive dwarves in sunny Miami? It's the latest place the lepers would look for us fugitives from justice, he often explained. They're freezing their LEP tails off in Russia. Meanwhile, we're sinking beers here in luxurious air-conditioned surroundings. Luxurious was a stretch. Even clean would have been a stretch. But the sozzled parrot was somewhere for fairy soldiers of fortune to meet and exchange war stories day or night, and so they were prepared to put up with Barnett's exorbitant prices and his constant sales pitches. How about a computer implant? persisted the innkeeper. Everybody has implants these days. How do you keep tabs on the LEP? Tombstone pulled down the brim of his felt hat so that it covered his eyes. Believe it or not, Riddles, I'm not on the hot list anymore. What you're looking at now is one of a 100% legit citizen. Heck, I've even got a visa for be above ground. Groom chunks, said Barnett doubtfully. Tombstone slid a plastic square across the bar. Read it and weep. Barnett squinted at the gnomish writing and checked the official hologram. Looks pretty real, he admitted. That is because it is real, my beer-watering friend. Barnett shook his head. 
No, I don't get it. If you could be anywhere, why are you here? Tombstone tossed a handful of bezel nuts into his carnivorous mouth, and Barnett swore that after each crunch there was an echo. I'm here, the, said Tombstone eventually, because of the clientele. Barnett was even more befuddled. What? Thieves, mercenaries, extortionists, and forgers? Tombstone's grin went wide and bright. <laughs> yep, my kind of people. Barnett checked on a pitcher of toad sludge that he was fermenting for the pixies. You're a riot, Tombstone, you know that? Before Tombstone could answer, a plastic parrot on the bar opened its beak and squawked. New post, squawked its animatronic mouth. New post, message board. Excuse me, said Barnett Riddles with exaggerated politeness. While I check this extremely handy implant I have in my head. Handy until you pass a microwave and lose ten years of memory, commented Tombstone. Then again, you spent so much time in here that you probably won't miss the old decade. Barnett was not listening. His eyes fogged over as he checked the illegal implant that had been hardwired directly into his cortex by a disbarred doctor. After a couple of hmm and one really, he returned to the here and now. How are the brain cells? inquired Tombstone mildly. I hope the message is worth it. Don't you worry about it, Mr. 100% Legit, said Barnett briskly. This one's for us criminals. He pounded the bar with his buzz baton, sending sparks rippling across the length of the brass rail. Crack, he called across the room. You have a ship, right? One of the dwarves at the end of the booth raised a grizzled head. Beer foam fell in blobs from his beard. Yeah, I got a gyro. Bit of a crock, but she runs okay. Burnett clapped his hands, already counting his commission. Good, a job came in on the board. Two humans kill him dead. Kruick shook his head slowly. No killing dead. We may be criminals, but we're not human. The client will accept a full wipe. Can you stomach that? A full wipe? Interrupted Tombstone. Isn't that dangerous? Burnett sniggered. Not if you keep your fingers away from the electrodes. Two humans, brother and sister, by the name of Butler. Tombstone twitched. Butler, brother and sister? Burnett closed one eye, consulting his implant. Yeah, I'm shooting the details across to your gyro, Kruick. This is a rush job. Top dollar, as the mud man would say. The dwarf called Kruick checked the charge in an old-fashioned blunderbuss neutrino. These mud men won't be saying much of anything by the time I'm finished with them. He pounded the table to summon his warriors. Let's go, my fine fellas. We have brains to suck. Tombstone stood quickly. You guys have room for one more? <laughs> I knew it, chuckled Barnett Riddles. 100% legit, I don't think so. Says I laid my eyes on you. This guy has history, I says. Kruik was buckling on a belt loaded with spikes, shells, and dangerous looking implementations with fuses and capacitors. Why should I take you, stranger? You should take me because if your pilot gets killed to death by these butler humans, then I can take his place. An uncharacteristically skinny dwarf looked up from the romance novel he was reading. K killed to death? He said, lip trembling slightly. I say, Carrick, is that likely? I've got experience with the butlers, said Tombstone. They always go for the pilot first. Kruick sized up Tombstone, taking in his powerful jaws and muscled legs. All right, stranger, you take the co-pilot's chair. You get a junior share and no quibbling. Tombstone grinned. Why quibble now when we can quibble later? Kruick thought about this statement for a moment until his brain ached. All right, whatever. Everybody take a sober pail and mount up. We have some humans to wipe. Tombstone followed his new captain across the bar floor. How good's your mind wiping equipment? Kruick shoved. Who cares, he said simply. I like your attitude, said Tombstone. The butlers in question were, of course, the very same butlers who had escaped the mesmerized wrestling fans and who were now, 30 minutes after Kruick took on his new co-pilot, taking a moment to catch their breath in the morning sunshine on the shore of Cancun's lagoon. These two were being pursued by Turnball Root more for his own entertainment than the possibility that they could actually interfere with his plans. Though it was possible that opponents as formidable as the butlers had proved themselves to be troublesome, and Turnball's plans were delicate enough to, without adding troublesome humans to the mix. Better to wipe them, at least. Also, they had escaped the first time, so Turnball was irked, which he did not like. 
Juliet squatted just above the waterline, listening to the sounds of party laughter and the tinkling of champagne flutes stream across the water from a passing yacht. I have an idea, brother, she said. Why don't we ask Artemis for a million dollars and just retire? When I could retire, you could be my butler. The butler sat beside her. Frankly, I don't think Artemis has a million dollars. He's put everything into this latest project. The project, he calls it. What's he stealing now? Nothing. Artemis has moved on from crime. These days, he's saving the world. Juliet's arm froze halfway through the motion of throwing a pebble. Artemis Fowl moved on from crime? Our Artemis Fowl? Isn't that against Fowl family law? Butler didn't exactly smile, but his scowl definitely grew less pronounced. This is hardly the time for jokes, sister. He paused. But if you must know, the Fowl statutes actually state that a family member caught strain onto the straight and narrow can have his Dr. Evil Manuel and suction cups confiscated. Juliet snickered. <laughs> Section cups. Butler's customary scowl quickly reasserted itself. Seriously, sister, this is a sinister situation we find ourselves in, pursued by fairy agents and on the far side of the world from my principal. What are you even doing here? Who sent you on this wild goose chase? Butler had been thinking about this. Artemis sent me. He must have been coerced, though it didn't seem so. Perhaps he was tricked. Tricked? Artemis Fowl? He has changed. Butler frowned, patting the spot where his shoulder holster would normally hang. Artemis has changed. You would barely recognize him now. He's so different. Different? How? Butler's frown deepened, a slash between his eyebrows. He counts everything. Steps, words, everything. I think five is the big number. Also rows. He groups all the stuff around him into little rows, usually five per row, or ten. I heard stuff about that. Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, OCD. And he's paranoid. He doesn't even trust me anymore. Butler's head dropped to his chest. Not even me. Juliet tossed the pebble far into the lagoon. It sounds like Artemis needs help. Butler nodded. How about you? You've had quite a bit sprung on you in the past hour. Juliet raked the shoreline with her fingers, gathering pebbles. What? You mean little things like being chased by a mesmerized horde? And the fact that fairies do exist? Those tiny things? Butler grunted. He had forgotten how much his sister made fun of him and how he, for some reason, put up with it. Yes, those tiny things, he said, elbowing her fondly. Don't worry about me, brother. I'm a modern woman. We're tough and smart, haven't you heard? I get it. Your coping, is that it? No, brother. I feel fine. The butlers are together and nothing can stand against us. The new memories aren't freaking you out? Juliet laughed and the sound did butler's heart good. Freaking me out? What are we, the 70s? No, the memories are not freaking me out. As a matter of fact, they feel... She thought about her next sentence for a while. They feel right in my head. They belong where they are. How could I have forgotten Holly? Or Mulch? Butler pulled a pair of sunglasses from a jacket pocket. They were a little clunkier than the current style and had totally tiny solar panels in the arms. With fairies on our tail, we may need these. Juliet plucked them from his fingers, and the stimulus from the contact brought memories flooding back. Artemis made these from dismantled LEP helmets so we could see through fairy shields. LEP are sneaky, but Artemis is sneakier. I remember these glasses. Why'd you even bring them? Boy Scout rule number one, be prepared. There are fairies around us all the time. I don't want to accidentally shoot one, or miss one for that matter. Juliet hoped her brother was being funny. You wouldn't shoot a fairy, said Juliet, slipping the glasses onto her face. Immediately, something appeared in her vision as though it had just popped out of a toaster. The something was certainly not human. It hung suspended from a harness and was aiming a bulbously barreled weapon at her head. Whatever it was wore a bodysuit that seemed to be made of viscous tar-like substance, which clung to its wobbling torso and coated every hair of its shaggy beard. Shoot the fairy! She yelped, shocked. Shoot it! Most people might have assumed that Juliet was joking. After all, what were the chances that a fairy would show up at the very moment she donned fairy filters? Not to mention the fact that Juliet was well known for her inappropriate sense of humor and regularly spouted witticisms in moments of mortal danger. 
For example, when Christian Varley Penrose, her Susan Struckler at the Madame Co. Agency, lost his grip on the north face of Everett and went plummeting earthward with only a tiny skinny girl between him and certain death, Juliet braced herself and called to her sensei as he pinwheeled past. Hey Penrose, surely saving you is worth some extra credit. So, it would be quite re reasonable to assume that when Juliet yelled, Shoot the fairy, she was actually joshing her big brother. But Butler did not assume this for a second. He was trained to recognize stress registers, but even if Artemis hadn't forced him to listen to that MP3 lecture in the car, he knew the difference between genuinely shocked Juliet and having a laugh Juliet. So when Juliet cried, shoot the fairy, Butler decided a course of aggressive action in the time it would take a hummingbird to flap its wings. No gun, so no shooting, he thought, but there are options. The option Butler chose was to grasp his sister's shoulder firmly and push her sideways so she actually skidded along the pebbled beach her shoulder plowing a furrow in the stones. Scratch shoulder, I'll be hearing that for weeks. Butler swung both arms forward and used the momentum to pull himself up and into a full tilt launch at whatever had spooked Juliet. At this point, he could only hope that the whatever was close enough to grapple. Otherwise, there was a fairy somewhere laughing into his face mask and calmly aiming a weapon. His luck held. Butler made contact with something squat and lumpy, something that struggled and bucked like a pig in a blanket and exuded a particular odor that a person might experience if that person were unfortunate enough to somehow end up face down a medieval swill patch. Oh, I know that smell, Butler realized, holding on grimly. Dwarf. Whatever was holding the dwarf up whined and dipped, dunking Butler and his wriggling captive into the lagoon's waist-high water. For Butler, the dunking was harmless enough. He was virtually clamped around the invisible dwarf, and in fact the cool water felt quite refreshing. But for the shimmer-suited fairy, the sudden dip was catastrophic. A brace of contact with the sharp scree of the lagoon bed punctured his camouflage suit, breaking the skin, releasing the charge. The dwarf, Kurik, was suddenly visible. Aha, said Butler, hauling Kruik from the surf. Dwarf head, good. Kruik had forfeited his gift of tongues along with the rest of his magic, but he had been living among the humans for long enough to pick up a smattering of several languages and Butler's simple statement was terrifyingly easy to interpret. Dwarf head? This mod man's gonna eat my head! Butler was actually glad to see the dwarf's head because dwarf heads are disproportionately large, and this particular dwarf's head had even more bulbous than the rest. It was almost Butler's size and there was a helmet perched on top of it. With a fairy helmet, I can see what this little guy sees. It was the helmet Butler was after, not the meaty noggin inside. Come here, Slippy! grunted the bodyguard, intuitively snapping the helmet's seals and popping it off. Did you just try to shoot my sister? Recognizing the word shoot, Kruik glanced down at his own hands and were dismayed to find them empty. He had dropped his gun! Kruik was a career criminal and had lived through many close calls without losing his nerve. He had once faced down a gang of drunken goblins armed with only a jar of burn lotion and three bottles tops, but this bloodthirsty giant with a face of fury and a thirst for brains finally sent him over the edge. No! he screamed shrilly. No brain biting! Buller ignored the tantrum and the musty helmet pong and gripped the protective hat one handed, like a basketball player might grip a basketball. Kurek's skull was now totally exposed, and the dwarf swore he could feel his brain trembling. When a dwarf finds himself unnerved to this extent, one of two things is likely to happen. One, the dwarf will unhook his jaw and attempt to eat its way out of trouble. This option was not available to Kruik because of his suit's hood. And second, this terrified dwarf would trim the weight. Trimming the weight is an aviator's trick, which envelop, involves jettisoning as much unnecessary cargo as possible to keep the ship in the air. Dwarves are capable of shedding up to a third of their body weight in less than five seconds. This is obviously a last resort and can only be performed once a decade or so. It involves a rapid expulsion of loose laid running fat, ingested mining dirt, and gases through what dwarf mommies politely refer to as the nether tunnel. Trimming the weight is, absolute, is mostly an automatic response and will be engaged when the heart rate nudges past 200 beats per minute, which happened to Kruik the moment Butler inquired whether Kruik had tried to shoot his sister. At that moment, Kruik more or less lost control of his bodily function and had just time to scream, No brain biting! before his brain decided to trim the weight and use the resulting propulsion to get the heck out of there. Of course, Butler was not aware of these biological details. All he knew was that he was suddenly flying backward, up high through the air, holding on to a jet-powered dwarf. Not again, he thought. Possibly the only human who would have had this thought in the situation. 
Butler saw Juliet shrinking into the distance, her mouth a shocked dark circle. And to Juliet, it seemed as though her brother had suddenly developed the power of flight while wrestling a dwarf clad in a shiny hooded leotard. I'll worry about Juliet worrying about me later, thought Butler, trying not to think about the glossy, bubbled stream pushing him further into the sky and closer to whatever craft they were suspended from. Look out below. Butler had a more urgent problem than Juliet worrying about him, which he realized upon jamming Kruick's helmet onto his own head. He and Kruick were coming up on the gyro, fast with no control over their approach. All Kruick could do was yell something about his brain, so it was up to Butler to see them through this alive. Altitude was not the problem. They weren't high enough to sustain any real damage, especially with the watery matches below. The problem was the gyro's rotor blade, which would slice them both into fine strips if they passed through it, then doubtless the gyrocopter would explode and incinerate the slices. The engine was whisper quiet, but a couple of bodies passing through the blade would soon blow the mufflers. My last act on Earth could be to expose the fairy people, and there is nothing I can do to prevent it. Up they went, whooshing backward, wind snagging their clothes, chilling their skin. The dwarf's eyes were wide and rolling, and his flesh hung in loose flaps. He was chubby before, I'm sure of it. The gyro blade was feet away as they whiplashed over the top of the craft and hung suspended for a nanosecond as Kruick finally ran out of the nether tunnel stream. Nice timing, snarled Butler. Then down they went directly toward the rotors. Still, thought Butler, killed saving my sister from a murderous dwarf. It could be worse. At the last possible moment, the gyro's rotor swiveled 90 degrees, tilting the craft dramatically, allowing Butler and Kruick to slide into it neatly on the leeward side. Butler barely had a moment to thank his lucky stars when he was thrust into yet another perilous situation. There seemed to be some serious fighting going on among a tired gang of dwarves. The passenger bay was littered with unconscious fairies while the three remaining dwarves were slugging it out, two against one. The one had a bloody nose and a sooty star on his shoulder where someone had tagged him with a neutrino, but still he seemed quite cheery. It's about time you got here, he said to Butler from the side of his mouth. These guys are quite angry I flipped their gyro. Tombstone, you collaborator, howled one of the remaining dwarfs. Tombstone, said Butler, managing to groan and speak at the same time. Yeah, said Butler's old friend Mulch Diggums. It's my out and about name, and lucky for you, I do go out. The gyro stabilizer steadied the craft, and Butler took advantage of the moment's peace to distangle himself from Kruick, whom he tossed out of the bay door. Ah, Kruick, said Mulch. Rarely does one meet someone with such a phonetically appropriate name. Butler wasn't even listening. If there was time to engage in Mulch's ramblings, he hadn't reached it yet. Instead, he returned to the remaining hostile dwarves. You two, he said, treating them with to his fiercest expression, an expression which had once made a troll think that maybe he had bitten off a little more than he could chew. The two in question quailed under Butler's gaze and wondered anxiously what this giant would order them to do. Butler jerked a thumb toward the bay door. Jump, he said, keeping it simple. The dwarves looked at each other, and the look spoke volumes. Should we actually jump into daylight, they thought, or should we stay and fight this terrifying man-mountain? They held hands and jumped. It took mere moments for Mulch to get control of the flight systems and drop the gyro down to scoop up Juliet. hi ho, Jade Princess, he called from the pilot's chair. How's the wrestling career going? I have an alter ego too now. Tombstone, they call me. What do you think? I like it, said Juliet, kissing Mulch's cheek. Thanks for rescuing us. Mulch smiled. Eh, there was nothing on the TV, except pay-per-view, and I refused to buy programs, on principle. Except the chef guy with the foul mouth. I love him and what he can do to a turkey crown and a couple of string beans. Juliet's newfound memories reminded her of Mulch's obsession with food. So you just happened to be in a bar when the call came in to these guys said Butler doubtfully, throwing some emergency field packs to the stranded dwarves below. Mulch tugged the virtual joystick, quickly pulling the gyro into the clouds. Yes, it's fate, my friends. I went against my own kind for you. I hope you appreciate it. Or rather, I hope your rich master appreciates it. Butler closes the hatch, shutting out the rush of air. The way I remember it, I did most of the saving. All you did was mess up my plan, snorted the dwarf. I was going to let him stun you both, winch you aboard, and make my move. Brilliant plan. As opposed to throwing yourself into the gyro rotor blade? Point taken. There was silence for a moment, the kind of silence you would definitely not get in any human flying machine. 
Also the kind of silence you get when a small group of people wonder just how long they can keep emerging from certain death situations with a reasonable amount of life in their bodies. We're off again, I suppose, said Mulch eventually. After another save the world, nick of time, seat of the pants adventure. Well, in the space of one night, we have been attacked by zombie wrestling fans and invisible dwarfs, said Butler. So it certainly looks like it. Where to? asked Mulch. Nowhere too sunny, I hope. Or too cold. I hate the snow. Butler found that he was smiling. Not with fondness exactly, but not with wolfish menace either. Iceland, he said. The gyro dipped sharply as Mulch momentarily let go of the V joystick. If you're kidding, Butler, that's not funny. Butler's smile disappeared. No, it isn't.